Welcome to the InfoWars Nightly News. I'm your host, Rob Dew. Today's date is Wednesday, July 1st, 2015. And here's a look at what's coming up. Excuse me, I'd like to ask you a few questions. Tonight, the fight against mandatory vaccines in California continues as concerned parents unite to recall the disastrous ruling. Meanwhile, Jim Carrey joins the fight by warning the public that vaccines are poisoning our children. I just want to start by asking the CDC one question. How stupid do you think we are? Plus, amazing drone footage. And is racist lightning responsible for burning down churches in the South? You'll find out up next on the InfoWars Nightly News. I want to make this announcement now. It's going up as we speak a day early. To celebrate the birth of our country and give a big thanks to all the info warriors out there, we are now offering free shipping on every item shipped out of the InfoWarsStore.com warehouse. That's free shipping on all t-shirts, books, and DVDs. Free shipping on Molan Labe and 1776 belt buckles, which are also 25% off while supplies last. Free shipping on all of our InfoWarsLife.com nutraceuticals. If it's in the InfoWarsStore.com warehouse, it's shipping for free, all during the month of July. It's our way of saying thanks to the true heart and soul of this operation, who stand beside us and support us as we wage an info war for liberty and freedom for all. Infowarstore.com, free shipping for the month of July. I want to talk about a perfect storm today. And the perfect storm I'm going to discuss is a really good perfect storm. I have prayed, literally, to be able to find a high quality gun sponsor that is affordable and that is extremely well made and effective that I can promote to my audience. About six months ago, we get contacted by Head Down Firearms, hdfirearms.com. Low cost compared to competitors, super high quality, super lightweight, super accurate, and the experts salivate over it and love it. Their entire line of 556, 308, and their accessories are simply amazing, and it's designed by battle-hardened vets that know what they wish they would have had. You need to go to hdfirearms.com today, or you can visit headdownproducts.com. That's headdownproducts.com. Welcome back to the InfoWars Nightly News. I'm your host, Rob Dew. Coming up, we're going to have a little debate and demonstration on drones, private versus government, and we're going to have a representative from SB277 Recalls to talk about some real solutions to get rid of this draconian forced vaccination bill. But first, we're going to talk about the rash of fires in the south of predominantly black churches. Is it all racially motivated? Is it all white people out there trying to get their digs in on black people after this horrible shooting that happened in South Carolina? Well, let's look at the first story here from NBC News. South Carolina black church, once torched by KKK, burns again. Uh, fire officials in South Carolina were digging Wednesday through scorched wreckage of a historic black church gutted overnight under unknown circumstances. At a news conference Wednesday, investigators said they were still determining what caused the fire at Mount Zion African Methodist Episcopal Church. Hard to say who might have come through here or what the cause of this was, you know, but we had problems here before, so... It really didn't go away. It's still here. The blaze at Mount Zion comes amid a rash of fires that have erupted at black churches all across the South in the past two weeks. Officials say at least two fires have already been declared arson. All of these recent fires have occurred in the weeks following the shooting at Emmanuel African Methodist Episcopal Church in Charleston on June 17th. A white gunman opened fire on a Bible study. And it wasn't just the Today Show that was insinuating that it was white people that burnt down this church uh, once again. Twitter warriors were out in full effect. Here's an article from Steve Watson. Twitter warriors falsely report spate of black burning churches. Several are not cases of arson. One church isn't even black. 
In the wake of the Charleston shooting, so-called so social justice warriors have played a huge role in promoting a contrived race war because, you know, it's good and progressive to have everyone feeling divided and angry. The warriors have done what they do best in creating a hashtag who is burning black churches with the clear insinuation that racist white supremacists are behind all the fires. In fact, here is a tweet from uh, one Charles Wade. Stop the passive language. Fires aren't breaking out at black churches. Black churches are being set on fire. But set on fire by whom? That's always the question. And uh, especially when we don't have investigations even being conducted or completed at this point, you have people jumping to conclusions. Uh, also today, National Review, church burnings, falsified history repeats itself. And Michelle Malkin goes in to talk about how in 1990s there was a USA Today reporter, Gary Fields, who said there were 61 different church fires that looked suspicious. And they did a, uh, a study of that, an analysis, and it showed that only four could be conclusively racially motivated. And um, it also talks about how uh, teacher alumnus agitator DeRay McKesson is now running around Twitter saying that the KKK is responsible for the half a dozen current church burnings, even though one of them was most likely accidental and had no criminal element or intent. One was touched off by an electrical short after a tree limb fell on the property, yanking the electrical service line. And one was involved, uh, it was actually a white church and it was struck by lightning. And we're going to have more <laughs> up, coming up talking about lightning. Uh, I'm going to be joined by Joe Biggs and Leanne McAdoo. But I want to go back to a older article. This is from Third World Traveler. And it's a Cohen, uh, it's COINTELPRO, The Untold American Story. And this is the section on the Ku Klux Klan. It reads, during the 1960s, the FBI's role was not to protect civil rights workers, but rather through the use of informants, the Bureau actively assisted the Ku Klux Klan and their campaign of racist murder and terror. Church committee hearings and internal FBI documents revealed that more than one quarter of all active Klan members during the period were FBI agents or informants. 44, however, Bureau intelligence assets were neither neutral observers nor in objective investigators, but active participants in beatings, bombings, and murders that claimed the lives of some 50 civil rights activists by 1964. Bureau spies were elected to top leadership posts in at least half of all Klan units. Uh, needless to say, the informant gained positions of organizational trust on the basis of promoting the Klan's fascist agenda. Incitement to violence and participation in terrorist acts would only confirm the infiltrator, infiltrator's loyalty and commitment. And now, where does this lead us? The FBI has come out and said they've issued a report. They're telling friends and family to avoid 4th of July celebrations. What does that all mean? That's interesting. And then I want to go back to a 2012 article from the New York Times, terrorist plots hatched by the FBI. I've got a one-minute clip here detailing some recent FBI uh, shenanigans going on, and, and it ends with a clip from uh, Judge Napolitano talking about this very same thing. Here it is. You've probably heard of the shooting at the Prophet Muhammad Cartoons exhibition in Garland, Texas over the weekend. But did you know Daily Mail used pictures from the event, but bowing to political correctness blacked out the offensive images? And thus far, President Barack Obama has been silent about the attacks. And CNN used the event to attack the Second Amendment when it was the Second Amendment that stopped the gunmen in their tracks. But now we've learned that the FBI has been watching one of the suspects using an FBI informant. Elton Simpson, the man identified as one of the two gunmen killed, was under surveillance by the FBI. FBI and subject of a terror investigation. The FBI has arranged numerous fake terror plots, including the Washington Metro bombing plot, the New York subway plot, the plan to blow up the Sears Tower in Chicago, the plot to bomb the Portland Christmas tree lighting, and others. In 2014, Human Rights Watch released a report stating nearly all high-profile domestic terrorism plots in the United States after 9-11 included the direct involvement of government agents and informants. You can read about all these stories at Infowars.com. Rob Dew reporting for PrisonPlanet.tv. Can the federal government take credit for saving us from a plot of its own creation? The FBI has foiled about 17 plots to kill Americans during the past 10 years. They all have a common and reprehensible thread. They were planned, plotted, controlled, and carried out by the federal government itself. In all of these 17 cases, from the Fort Dix 6 to the Lackawanna 7 to the Portland Parade Bomber, the feds found young men of Muslim backgrounds, loners who were bitter at America. They befriended them, cajoled them, and persuaded them that they could change the world by killing Americans. But none of this keeps us safe. All of this makes us less free, as any one of us can be entrapped. And we are fools if we praise the government for exposing a plot of its own creation and saving us from a danger that never existed. 
And one final clip that shows how the FBI likes to instigate this whole atmosphere of terror everywhere comes from the documentary, The Newberg Sting. And this is a uh, Agent Fuentes. And he's going to tell you about how he uh, has to keep the fear alive in all you out there. If you're uh, submitting budget proposals for a law enforcement agency, for an intelligence agency, you're not going to submit the proposal that we won the war on terror and everything's great because the first thing's going to happen is your budget's going to be cut in half. You know, it's my uh, opposite of Jesse Jackson's keep hope alive. This is keep fear alive. Keep it alive. And so this was, you know, just out of the church committee hearings that the FBI was working with the KKK to cause violence. And we're going to get more into that later, but I want to get more into maybe what caused this fire now. With I'm joined by uh, Leanne McAdoo, Joe Biggs, retired staff sergeant of the U.S. Army. Uh, Joe, what does, there have been some developments now with this latest church burning. What seems to have caused the fire at this point? Well, at this point in time, we know that lightning was more than likely the cause of this, that arson was not involved. Wait, that doesn't fit the racist narrative. How yeah, can I know. it be lightning? Well, it's racist because it's white lightning. Oh, okay. <laughs> That's why. Yeah, and so that we, just came out of CNN. So we're going to have to stop that. We need to ban that as well. And, it, you know, it, well, the FBI has been working with the National Weather Service to determine whether heavy storms in the area contributed to the fire. So, unfortunately, it doesn't look like people are going to get their wish that it was uh, racist white people that caused the latest fire. And, in fact, I showed you earlier that the people on Twitter were going crazy saying, you know, any church that burns anywhere, it must be white people. Right. Yeah, I actually found a, a cool tweet on uh, Twitter. So as you can see, a lot of people are just regurgitating what they see on the mainstream media. This guy says, stop the passive language. Fires aren't breaking out at black churches. Black churches are being set on fire. And uh, then you got this guy down here saying, huh, laugh out loud, arrest the racist lightning. You know, people just turn on the TV yeah. and this is where the fear mongering is coming in. Well, that and the social media, it's just, we're just, people just they just regurgitate. No one actually goes and looks into these things. They turn on the TV, they regurgitate it and just throw out whatever they heard, whatever talking point on something. If it was arson, the FBI would be saying it was arson. They wouldn't be covering for the racist lightning. They would actually be saying, no, we think somebody burnt this church down. And then there'd be an investigation. Now in Colorado, we just had a guy uh, arrested for putting up, I guess, anti-black flyers. And he was right. a black guy as he well. He was a black man. Right, there yeah. were these racist messages that were discovered at these predominantly black churches. And it turns out it was a black suspect. Uh, still no idea why he decided to go ahead and do that, but it's it's about provocatory and getting everyone riled up. Right, and that's Vincent Broughton, 44, who's black, facing charges for committed a, uh, a bias-motivated crime and disorderly conduct, and black suspect arrested after racist message discovered outside predominantly black church. So this is not, you know, it's you can't blame everything on white people. Right, or you can't automatically jump to the easiest conclusion that, oh, if a church is set on fire, then it must be someone in the KKK. I mean, because here you have proof that a black suspect was actually inciting these messages, even saying that it was like, hey, black men, you're, you're a target by the KKK, so that people would automatically think that it was put there by these white supremacist groups. But this has all led to what TV Land is now doing. They've pulled the Dukes of Hazard episodes amid, amid Confederate flag uproar. So the I, Confederate I knew flag that was going to happen. Burning down churches... They, uh, they've been talking about it. They actually interviewed Cooter, I think, uh, one of the cops from the Dukes of Hazard, who is vehemently against banning the flag. He says it's about heritage, and it's not about slavery, and it was a battle flag. It's, it's what they flew when they went into battle, and by taking that away, you're, you're disrespecting the people who fought in the Civil War, and they called it a Civil War for a reason. It was supposed to be, you know, it was brother against brother, and it wasn't all about slavery. In fact, the slaves didn't get released till the very end of the Civil War, and that was like Lincoln's last maneuver. It, he didn't come out saying, we're going to ban slavery in the beginning, even though there's a lot of people against it. There's a lot of people fighting to end slavery, and it would have ended, I think, anyway, right. had the Civil War. Well, they banned, they, slavery, they, they banned slavery in the South, but slavery still existed for two more years in the North. There That's you what go. people forget. Yeah. And right. where, where else has this gone? Now you have Daytona, the 500. They're not going to ban the Confederate flag, but they'll offer a flag exchange. Yeah. They didn't mention if it would be an ISIS flag or an American flag that they'd <laughs> give you, but they're, they're going to offer a flag in exchange. And I think it's funny <laughs> that Dale Earnhardt Jr. and Jeff Gordon both expressed last weekend their disapproval of the flag. These are guys who, you know, have made their living driving their cars in the South in that, you know, strictly Confederate flag heritage right. area going. It'll be interesting if Walmart's one of the sponsors for NASCAR, so maybe yeah. they will uh, hand out some ISIS flags instead. You never know, because they were making ISIS <laughs> right. cakes.
But let's look at some things that were built by slaves and that maybe, you know, we should tear down. If we're going to tear down everything that, that slaves have ever done yeah. and built or anything like that, you know, the Capitol, the U.S. Capitol is built by slaves. The White House. The White, House. The White House is built by slaves. Um, Pyramids. Most of our clothes yeah. are slaves. Most of our clothes are made labor. in slave factories. All our <laughs> iPads and iPhones are built in slave factories with suicide nets around them. But that's right. okay. You know, because Ban liberals iPhones. like those. They like, tr you know, the trendy iPhones. Well, I'm offended iPads. by ready for Hillary stickers. I think we should take those down and replace those with InfoWars stickers. There you go. Because Agreed. anything that doesn't make us feel good, we should automatically ban. Although, Joe, you were talking about the pyramids. Oh, they say uh, back in 2010, Egypt, new find shows slaves didn't build the pyramids. Do you believe that? Yeah, they got like 20,000 people to just volunteer. Like, hey, man, we're going to do this for free. Uh, we're going to let you whip us. We're not going to have any food or water. And we're just going to carry these really big stones on our back because yeah, we like day. you guys. Well, they're, you die. They're, they're claiming because they found a tomb that had, you know, some people in it that they think built the pyramids. You know, there's a hierarchy structure in a pyramid. The slaves are at the bottom. Right. And there's middlemen. And then you have the pharaohs at the top and the royalty. Well, it's just I like how, highly doubt it. That how they call the Irish slaves, like indentured servants. Exactly. So it's just you know, a fancy. Or... They worked really hard, but they got paid, sort of. You know, they got <laughs> food and water, but no, they weren't slaves. You know, you know, let's tear down the pyramids in South America because those were built by slaves. Well, okay. and don't forget the TPP, Obama actually rewrote a provision in it so that they're, they could still have slave labor included in these trade deals with countries that are still actively participating in slave quite labor a few. and sex trafficking. And right. And it's not the right. United States. Africa, Although we do buy Asia. the slave labor goods, and now we're going to be importing them more. Well, I don't know. Walmart sort of pays slave wages, and they sort of set the precedent for the minimum wage. So. They have. They they go in. They they uh, undercut the competition. So the competition goes away. Those high those high paying jobs there, mm -hmm. and then it's flooded with this low wage, mm -hmm. and then they they raise the prices back up. So they make more money, but they right. don't they don't pay their workers. And more. the taxpayers subsidize the low wages at. At sure. Walmart. And they probably give them property tax breaks because they go, oh, we're supplying them jobs. So that, yeah. you know, that we should ban Walmart. We should get fancy tombs. Everything should be banned at this point. <laughs> but, you know, finishing up here, we got a couple minutes left. The FBI is going around telling friends and family to avoid Fourth of July celebrations. We've got an FBI official earlier this year came out and said that they have to keep the fear alive to justify their terror budget. Oh. And back in 2012, the New York Times posted terror plots hatched by the FBI. So I, I did a report on this this morning. If the FBI is out there telling us to watch out and they're associated with the Klan and violence back in the 60s leading up to the 90s, there right. were still these connections going. You know, is the FBI going to be perpetrating terror plots and to blame it <laughs> on racist white people? But then yeah. last week, the last week, the articles that came out were Islamists not uh, what to be worried about. It's more of white people in America. They're the number one terror threat. Right. So this all plays into that leading up to this weekend. Right. Yeah. And don't forget the FBI released their map with their, where they're going to be set up, you know, uh, actively watching out for terror. And now ISIS has also released that same map. Oh, the same map. This yeah. is where we're going to target. Well, I'm going to have my Mossberg strapped on my back riding around. So if ISIS wants to come out and play, come <laughs> on and take it, buddy. That's right. And hey, we're going to be back with more. I've got a, uh, the person who started the SB 277 recalls. It's a real solution that you can get involved in and help change that, especially if you live in California. And I'm also going to have a drone here in the studio. We're going to talk a little bit about private versus government drones. So stay tuned for that. It's the InfoWars Nightly News. I'm your host, Rob Dew. Welcome back to the InfoWars Nightly News. This is our third segment, and we're going to go deep into what is now being called the one of the, I think, the biggest vaccine controversy in the nation at this time. And that is the vaccine bill, SB 277, which is mandating that every parent get their child vaccinated in the state of California. The governor just signed it. And I want to go over something that the governor said a few years ago. This is back in September 6, 2011. I am returning the Senate Bill 105 without my signature. The measure would impose criminal penalties on a child under the age of 18 if his parents uh, and the child of skis or snowboards did this without a helmet. While I appreciate the value of wearing a ski helmet, I am concerned about the continuing and seemingly in inexorable transfer of authority from parent to the state. Not every human problem deserves a law. I believe parents have the ability and responsibility to make good choices for their children. Okay. Now that is on for skiing, which you could go look up the stats. People die from skiing. People um, get maimed really bad when they don't wear helmets. It's a pretty smart thing to do. You could also look up the stats on bicycles. About six children a year die from bicycles. 
Now, this whole SB 277 started with this crazy measles outbreak that happened in Disneyland that was definitely transferred by workers who had already been vaccinated. And it came from a country that has a 98% vaccination rate, and they consider, uh, them, to, they consider them to be vaccine or measles free in that area. And I think it was uh, the Philippines where it, it originated from. Now, let's look at the money that was poured in for SB 277. Two million donated to lawmakers in 2013, 2014. Uh, opponents of the SB 277 link supporters to pharmaceutical donations. And you can look at the donations here. Over $2 million, Johnson & Johnson, GlaxoSmithKline, Eli Lilly. Those are your main vaccine makers. Merck is also in there, Bristol-Myers, Pfizer. And uh, the top senator there, Richard Pan, 95000 in donations. How do you think he's going to vote? Think he's going to vote yes? Yeah, of course he's going to vote yes. These people are paid off, especially in California, because they need so much money to live because that, that state has turned into a giant welfare state. Meanwhile, while the gov governor, Jerry Brown, is, is signing this law, he's got a, 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 they estimate $59 billion to fix the now crumbling roads. So I don't know how he's going to fix these roads. He should be worrying about the damn roads, not making sure kids are vaccinated against their parents' consent, which seems to be what he is concerned about. Now, all this vaccine media uproar has caused Jim Carrey to actually speak out on Twitter. But of course, he was attacked. And he's not even against vaccination. He's just saying, why do we have toxins in vaccines? And I'll get to that in a second. But the, the, hit, dogs, the hit dogs came out on him. You look at Salon.com. Jim Carrey leads California's paranoid anti-vax freakout. This corporate fascist must be stopped. Uh, here we are in Salon, carried away. Uh, <laughs> just everybody's attacking Jim Carrey. Here's the Daily Beast. Jim Carrey's descent into madness. Okay, here's a shot of him in a beard looking crazy because he asked a few simple questions. Let's look at some of his tweets. He even says, I'm pro-vaccine, anti-neurotoxin. Governor, California governor says yes to poisoning more children with mercury and aluminum in mandatory vaccines. This corporate fascist must be stopped. <laughs> they say mercury in fish is dangerous, but forcing all our children to be injected with mercury and thimerosal is no risk. Makes sense? I am not anti-vaccine. I'm anti-thimerosal, anti-mercury. Okay, the CDC can't solve a problem they helped start. It's too risky to admit they've been wrong about mercury and thimerosal. They are corrupt. Okay, these are just normal tweets from a guy who doesn't think mercury should be injected into small babies or aluminum or the other toxins that are in there. There's a lot more. You should actually read the damn insert to find out. And now I want you to watch this video testimonial. This is from a lady named Landy Cryer. And she had, she vaccinated her first two children and they had adverse reactions. They had asthma, anaphylactic shock, which means you stop breathing, and uh, shingles in the eye. So she decided not to vaccinate her third child, which is her choice to do as a parent. Informed consent. This is what the governor of California has taken away. And this is going to be a springboard and it's going to come to every state out there in the United States. They're going to force this vaccination program on you. And then they're going to bring in more vaccines. They're going to say, oh, you need a vaccine against, uh, tetter or psoriasis, whatever. They're going to come up with something that you need a vaccine for. Oh, you don't like what the government says? We got a vaccine for that. So watch what this mother says. And this is what they're going to take away from you out there. Be warned. Hi, I'm Landy. I have three children who reacted to vaccines, and I'd like to share why I'm opposed to mandatory vaccination. Uh, my oldest, um, my, my first two children were both fully vaccinated. My boy wheezed after, two, after his two-month shots, and um, I asked the pediatrician, could the, could the vaccines make him wheeze? And, you know, she kind of looked at me like I had eight heads. She just denied that, that it could have anything to do with the vaccines. And so we, we continued to vaccinate him, and by the time he was 18 months, he had full-blown asthma and had a childhood full of hospitalizations, ICU, and a lot of respiratory problems. And it wasn't until I stopped vaccinating my older two children that they immediately got healthier. I took them to a holistic practitioner and we got them off all the antibiotics and, and, 
and the vaccines, and their health improved immensely. So with my third child, I was not vaccinating because I had concerns about the asthma, and I really truly felt that, and I had done some research and saw that asthma was actually listed as a adverse side effect of, of vaccines. So I was concerned about that, so I didn't vaccinate the younger, my, my third child. But he had a, a bad accident. He cut his cheek on a metal scooter. And so when I took him to the ER, he had to get a lot of stitches. And they convinced me that he needed to take, because of tetanus, fear of tetanus, because he was cut by metal, he needed to have the DTAP shot, which was only given in DTAP. I couldn't get it separate. Like, I couldn't just get a tetanus shot. So he, I went ahead and caved, and they gave him the shot. And within seven days, he had a really large uh, lump on his arm at the injection site. And it was very hot. And um, he said his arm hurt. He couldn't raise his arm. So I called the pediatrician, and she just told me that he was having an, a localized reaction to the vaccine and to put ice on it and watch him. And within eight to 10 hours of that, he started um, crying, and he had hives over his entire body, was covered in hives. He started saying he couldn't breathe, and it was very scary, so we took him to the emergency room. And by the time we got there, they said his throat was closing, and they gave him a shot of steroids and did a bunch of things to open up his airway. And he continued to have to be on um, oral and topical um, Benadryl as well as steroids for 10 days, continued to break out in hives for a full 10 days. And it was basically an allergic reaction to something in the DTAP shot. And after that, I really st started researching more about vaccines and found out all the adverse side effects that they can have. And I realized that a lot of these problems my children had had were actually a result of the vaccines. And my daughter, when she was a teenager, developed shingles in her eye. And the eye doctor asked us, has she had the chicken pox? And I said, no, you know, but she had the vaccine. So basically, by her getting the vaccine for the chicken pox, it caused her to get shingles in her eye. And she's had two or three more episodes of that uh, as a result of having that vaccine as well. And I'm very opposed to mandatory vaccination because I am concerned that with my youngest, he had the anaphylactic reaction to the vaccine. So I would probably be able to get a medical exemption for that one vaccine, but I would, he would not qualify for an exemption on the other vaccines. And there's so many now. And my concern is that there's the same ingredients or some of the same ingredients which could have caused his reaction. And I don't want to play Russian roulette with, his, with him again. And I don't want to put him through that. It was very traumatic and very scary for everyone involved. So while I was vaccinating my older two children, you know, I noticed that their immune systems were weaker. They were getting sick a lot. They were sick all the time with different things. Um, I didn't vaccinate my third child, and he was never sick. He never had ear infections. So I, I kind of realized that the immune system left untouched was a lot stronger and the symptoms and things when he would get a cold were a lot less severe than when the older two, which I had on the vaccine schedule, they tended to um, be sick more frequently. Um, so with all of them, I, I kind of figured out that just building the immune system is the way to uh, beat illness, and not necessarily does it have to come from a vaccine. And I feel I'm not too concerned about my kids getting whooping cough or the measles because I know that if I keep their immune system strong, that they'll be able to overcome that. And I won't have to be concerned about major side effects because they have a strong immune system. And with enough vitamin A and enough vitamin C and you know, taking them to a holistic doctor, I feel like that, that they would be able to recover and be stronger and be granted the, the, life, the gift of lifelong immunity from if they did get those diseases. NBC severing all its business ties with Trump in the last hour, Brooke. And this is because there have been calls for days from Hispanic leaders saying, how can you be in business with this man if he is calling Mexican immigrants rapists and killers? Billionaire and presidential candidate Donald Trump has been lambasted by NBC and Univision for these comments. The U.S. has become a dumping ground for everybody else's problems. When Mexico sends its people they're not sending their best. They're not sending you. They're not sending you. They're sending people that have lots of problems, and they're bringing those problems with us. They're bringing drugs. They're bringing crime. They're rapists. And some 
I assume are good people. But I speak to border guards, and they tell us what we're getting. And it only makes common sense. It's coming from all over South and Latin America, and it's coming probably, probably from the Middle East. But we don't know, because we have no protection, and we have no competence. We don't know what's happening. And it's got to stop. And it's got to stop fast. Islamic terrorism is eating up large portions of the Middle East. They become rich. I'm in competition with them. They just built a hotel in Syria. Can you believe this? They built a hotel. When I have to build a hotel, I pay interest. They don't have to pay interest because they took the oil that when we left Iraq, I said we should have taken. So now ISIS has the oil. Donald Trump is now second in the New Hampshire and Iowa polls among likely caucus goers and is standing by his misrepresented comments on immigration, rape, and crime. And now with my statements on immigration, which happen to be correct, uh, they are going to take a different stance, and that's okay. Misrepresented comments, which are unfortunately true. Thomas didn't find the man he was looking for, but something far worse. Thomas says he found 47-year-old Martin Vasquez in the act of raping a six-year-old girl. Officers say neighbors told them that several of the neighborhood children play in Vasquez's backyard. A spokeswoman for the Davidson County Sheriff's Office said Yuseda was in this country illegally. Gurau Aguilar faces three counts of aggravated sexual battery of a person under the age of 13. Jacobo Gurau faces one count of rape of a person under the age of 13. Police believe 19-year-old Sergio Perez, an illegal immigrant, attacked the woman in her home Sunday. 418 children were raped by illegals in the state of North Carolina in the month of August 2014 alone. Another drug investigation led to a shootout that left a deputy wounded and a police informant dead. It all started with this big rig filled with marijuana. Well, you mentioned the 18-wheeler. We had 300 pounds of marijuana or more and obviously a homicide all in front of an entrance to a quiet neighborhood. The Pinal County Sheriff asking President Obama to send troops. Sheriff Paul Babu says Mexican drug cartels now control parts of Arizona all the way up to Metro Phoenix. Drug cartels control this area. And this is unacceptable. And the local law enforcement cannot handle and stop this on our own. This latest move details that not only does NBC reinstate known liars like Brian Williams, they are also in the big business of controlling the narrative, whether or not American lives are in grave danger. And it just goes to show how far Americans will be diverted from a hardcore reality in the name of supposed political correctness. An insouciant generation will inherit a country on track to go down harder than Greece where our immigration policies allow thousands of foreign felons to be released onto the streets of America while an epidemic of child rape goes largely ignored in their own backyards. You want answers? I think I'm entitled. You want answers! I want the truth! You can't handle the truth! You don't want the truth because deep down in places you don't talk about at parties. You want me on that wall. You need me on that wall. We use words like honor, code, Loyalty. We use these words as the backbone of a life spent defending something. You use them as a punchline. John Bound for Infowars.com. And that was John Bound's report on the vilification of Donald Trump. And that's what's in store for you out there if you don't say the right thing, depending on who's in charge. Now I want to. Turn your attention to this little guy here. This is a drone I recently took to North Carolina on a family vacation with all the shark attacks that were going on in North Carolina. Alex mandated that I bring that out there, learn how to fly it, and uh, shoot some footage of the ocean. And we're going to have a report coming up on that. But I wanted to talk about responsible and irresponsible uses of drones real quick. I want to fly through some articles. Uh, back in 2012, we held the first annual drone mob, Texas Protest Spy Drones. And uh, you could go on that. I would say take a look at that footage. We have a pretty amazing array of drones that we flew, and they were kind of like kitty drones. I wouldn't say they were anything big and scary. Uh, some guy brought out some pretty cool model airplanes as well. We got some interesting videos there. Uh, now, here's an irresponsible use. Meth drone crashes near U.S.-Mexico border. This was back in January of 2015. 
Um, so there you go. That's an irresponsible use. Here's another one. Drone crash at White House reveals security risks. So this is the guy, he was actually a government worker who was drunk, who flew his drone into uh, near the White House and crashed on the, on the White House lawn. Now here I think is a little more of a responsible use. Seal Beach uses drone to track young great white sharks. And it talks about how the uh, lifeguards out there are flying, looks like the same type of drone over uh, the beaches out there to monitor what the sharks are doing. And they do see a lot of sharks, especially in the Pacific Ocean. You have a lot of great white activity. Here's another irresponsible use. Tourists spark security scare in Milan after crashing remote controlled drone into famous cathedral. So this is the Milan Cathedral that was just, took years, hundreds of years to build this thing. And so of course some jerk and a drone crashes into it. Here's another one from the BBC. Court decides wrangle over shot down drone. This is a story of a guy who was flying a drone over his, uh, his pecan grove and some guy shot it down. It, one, his neighbor said it was flying over his area. Well, they went to small claims court. The judge sided with the drone flyer. And so now he's trying to collect on the money he spent on his homemade drone. So, so you know, responsible use, irresponsible person on the ground shooting the drone out of the sky. Now, here's another one. Aviation expert warns of disasters after drones near miss with an Airbus. This just happened a couple days ago. A drone narrowly missed a commercial aircraft coming into land at Heathrow and a second such incident in less than a year. So there are responsible and irresponsible uses of drones. I took the drone out to fly over the waters of the Outer Banks in North Carolina to look at the sea life. And I found some amazing stuff, some stingray footage, some dolphin footage, and we're gonna go to that report right now. Recently, I took a family vacation to the Outer Banks of North Carolina. It was my in-laws 50th anniversary celebration and they treated their family to an amazing week of fun in the sun. But due to the recent hysteria by the mainstream media of shark attacks in that area, Alex Jones sent me armed with a drone. We're gonna take the drone out for a spin, see if any of this works. Okay. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. The DJI Phantom 2 Plus Vision to be exact. It was fairly easy to fly, and when I flew it over the ocean, I was amazed at how much sea life was swimming around us near the shore. Here you can see large schools of fish. I saw numerous cattle rays, including this amazing footage of a mating dance. And on one particular day, there were dozens of dolphins swimming near the coast. It was purely magical watching the video of the adult and juvenile dolphins swimming so close to shore. I even found what I thought were info warriors, but I guess they didn't like the drone. But most people were okay with it flying around. But I asked myself, are we being conditioned to their presence? In San Diego, the lifeguards are flying them offshore looking for sharks. In fact, a man was bitten by a shark south of our location, and a young boy caught a juvenile shark in the surf right next to us. But you are more likely to be killed by a jellyfish, deer, or even a vending machine than you are a shark. There are a lot of positive uses for drones, especially in video production. A shot like this would have cost thousands of dollars in men and equipment. But the government, which has been caught using drones to spy on us and even kill American citizens, is obviously not what this country was founded on. So if you are a private drone operator, use your drone in a positive fashion and don't give the bureaucrats an excuse to take this amazing tool out of our hands like they've tried to do with guns. Rob Dew reporting for InfoWars.com and InfoWars Nightly News. And so that was the inaugural voyage of the InfoWars drone. We're going to be using this definitely in the future for all kinds of news gathering purposes, responsible purposes, not irresponsible purposes. Now, this might be a little irresponsible, but I'm going to attempt to fly the drone as we go out to break in the studio. So uh, we'll be back. We're going to have the, um, the person who organized the SB277 recall website to kind of get people activated into doing something worthwhile. And here we go.
Welcome back to our final segment on InfoWars Nightly News. This is our July 1st, 2015 segment. I'm your host, Rob Dew. Joining me now on the phone is the organizer for SB 277 Recalls. It is Lauren Stevens. Lauren, how are you doing today? Hey, I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. So tell me, what was the impetus for starting uh, SB 277 Recalls? What got you involved in this? Just give everybody out there the whole pitch. <laughs> Thanks. Well, this started um, over the Senate vote in favor of SB 277, which not sure if everybody realizes this, but this was passed not just by Democrats, but also by a few Republicans. Um, and one of the supporters of one of those Republican senators contacted me about doing the recall. And once I got on board with that, then other people started contacting me to do recalls in their district as well. So, you know, we've been pretty busy the past, what, six weeks, I guess it is, trying to get some of these recalls initiated. And, uh, you know, it, it takes a while. It takes about a month or so to actually get to the certification process through the state. And what will happen uh, when you recall a senator? Well, how, how does that process work, and how long would it take from the initiation of it to actually get them removed from office? Well, here's how it works in the state of California, which, you know, I was involved in some recalls in Wisconsin, and California actually has a much better and more efficient system, believe it or not. Um, what happens here is that initially you'll do an intent to recall notice. So we have to get 40 to 60 signatures. Uh, from people in whatever district, we serve that the intent to recall on the lawmaker, senator, or assembly person. Um, they have seven days to come up with a response. Once that happens, we have to file uh, all this stuff in the newspaper. We have to publish it in the newspaper, which is very expensive. It's like a quarter page display ad, so they're they're not cheap. Um, once that happens, then we have to draft a recall petition. And then the state has, um, I'm not sure the timeline, but the state has to certify that. Once that is certified, then we get the green light to start. And from there we get, uh, I think it's 160 days to get the amount of signatures. And the number of signatures is all listed on our website. So people can kind of get an idea of, you know, some districts are much tougher than others and some are much easier than others to get the signatures much lower signature amount. Right. And so right now, I guess you're looking for volunteers and people to get on with this effort, also conduct different uh, social media campaigns to get people, I guess, bring up awareness to this, that this could actually happen, that we don't need medical tyranny forced down our throats, especially when Jerry Brown's the same governor that vetoed a bill about mandatory <laughs> helmets back in 2011, it, saying it's the parents' responsibility. Yeah, well, you know, it's not just that, but we had AB 2109 a couple of years ago where uh, Jerry Brown made an executive order that said um, that parents still could keep their parental and religious rights and opt out through that. But so, honest to God, I don't know anybody who really thought he was going to sign SB 277. I, I think it's bizarre. I wasn't expecting it. I mean, we all knew there was a chance. But he didn't waste any time. I mean, he did this within 24 hours of the bill signing, uh, within 24 hours of the bill passing the Senate, and he had 12 days. So I think he was sending us a clear message by doing it so quickly. Um, it's pretty astonishing. You know, Democrats are supposed to be pro-choice. They're supposed to be pro-freedom. You know, so for... It's mostly Democrats behind this, but again, there are some Republicans. I don't want to pick on Democrats here, but... But um, this is not what, what Democrats have expected from their party, and a lot of them have left the Democrat Party over this, and I don't think they're going to come back. Well, and we've had in Texas, we had several bills introduced, uh, forcing vaccines on people, um, changing all the, the parameters, taking away the uh, informed consent and, and stuff like that. And those were all defeated before they even got to our governor, who I think would have vetoed him anyway. He seems to be a, uh, a parental choice type uh, governor. Yeah. But but I think what I, really influenced those guys a lot in California was how much the, the drug makers were giving to California lawmakers. That came out in the Sacramento Bee uh, on June 18th. The industry gave more than $2 million to current lawmakers in 2013, 2014. And well, not only was there that money, but in some cases, they were whining and dining these lawmakers 
and donating to them as well. So uh, one of the lawmakers, they actually found out that he, him and his wife uh, did this trip to Hawaii. They had this really nice expensive dinner at this really nice restaurant with uh, somebody from the pharmaceutical company. I mean, this is what's going on. So these guys are supposed to be representing us. And that's all they're supposed to be doing. So for this to even pass, trust me, there's going to be some huge backlash. Well, you know, you look at people like Richard Pan got 95,000, uh, Assembly Speaker Tony Atkins, 90,000. I mean, these are substantial amounts of money that these guys are getting. And so, <laughs> of course, you could see why they sell out, but that's not why they're put in that position. They're put in that position to actually stand up for the rights of the people, not for these giant corporations who just, for them, it's a, it's, it's a game changer for them. They can just force as many vaccines as they want on people. They've been shown to have adverse reactions. And so it's the parent's choice in which, you know, to give their kids these vaccines. And that's what, that's what really has pissed a lot of people off. Even Jim Carrey came out against it, uh, forcing this kind of medical tyranny um, on us. And, you know, I'd just like to note, um, Cycling and, and uh, has, has killed about 109 people in 2013, and measles has killed no one. And yet the reason this has all come about is because measles uh, supposedly happened in, uh, in Disneyland, started, started there, which it was also spread by people who had the measles, or had the measles vaccine, at least. And yeah. uh, so that, it's just this, this fear factor they push that, oh, you're going to get the measles. When I was a kid... And probably when we, you were younger, too. Yeah, we got the measles. You got the measles. Big deal. Right. Got, and you missed a few days of you school. Know, you know, they also have a mandatory chicken pox vaccine. It's like, wow, who didn't have chicken pox? I mean, even watch the Brady Bunch. The whole family had chicken pox. And in fact, when one kid would get it, you'd throw all your other kids in the same room and make them all get it at the same time and be done with it. So yeah. yeah. I was the last kid in my family to get it. And um, <laughs> I got the worst case of it. I had uh, the scars on the soles of my feet. Didn't it is die. Not pleasant. I was fine. I watched uh, watched TV for a week, and you know, ate uh, you know, ate in front of the TV. It was just a good time, just sitting around doing nothing, reading comic books and stuff. Yeah, you get to stay home, eat ice cream, drink Seven Up, and and like you said, watch TV. Of course, back then we didn't have cable, but you know, hey, it was still good. But I'll tell you something that's really disturbing to me, and that is that our legislature and these I call them paranoid vaxxers. I mean, they have really, really had a massive fear-mongering campaign. They have got a lot of people absolutely terrified that if they leave their house with their kid, their kid's going to catch some disease. Yeah, it's there, totally there ridiculous. There have been stories. There's stories, I think, on the Sacramento Bee. No, the L.A. Times did a story on several ladies who stated, you know, I mean, they did actual interviews with their real name, so this wasn't fake, you mm -hmm. know. These women would not take their kids to the playground, um, they would tell people, you know, if your kid's not vaccinated, I don't want your kid around me, right. you know, around my kids. I mean, they are really frightening a lot of people. And, and that's really sad. You know, they call us crazy. They call our side crazy. We're not crazy like that. You know, we are not. No, we actually crazy. read the medical inserts that are provided by the companies that say these things cause problems and, and don't take them if you're pregnant, especially Hey, finishing up real quick. We're, we're about to run out of time. You have some breaking news that you're working with a former governor, uh, gubernatorial candidate of California. Yes, actually, um, I am now working with Tim Donnelly. He's a former assemblyman here in the state of California, and he also ran for governor in 2014. Um, we have decided to start the referendum process. Um, Mr. Donnelly filed that this morning with the attorney general's office, and it's already on their website. Um, we had to roll this out pretty quickly because some pro SB 277 people we're actually in the process of organizing a, what I would call a sham referendum, where they would soak up all the donor money, they would take all the volunteers um, away from our recall efforts because they're trying to actually save the politicians who are under recall. It's of very course. shady and very yeah. sneaky. Now, that sounds and, like a Monsanto tactic. They definitely learn from them. Lauren, thanks for joining us. Uh, you can find out you. more information, sb277recalls.com. Get involved. This is solutions. This is what it's all about. You have to get in the game if you're going to make any changes over here. That's the only way this stuff is going to work out. So California, SB277 Recalls, SB277Recalls.com. And that's going to do it for tonight's show. Uh, I'm your host, Rob Dew. It's been a pleasure doing the uh, first day of the month here in July. We are already halfway done with 2015, and it has definitely turned into a humdinger of a year. You can find us here Every weekday night, 7 p.m. Central, please be, consider becoming a member of PrisonPlanet.tv. 
It is a great way to help fund the, everything you see here. Everything is funded by PrisonPlanet.tv, so we thank our members out there, and we'll see you next time.